بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of the life of Aisha mother of the believers with me your host Fatima Barakatullah At the end of the last episode we came to the moments of death of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم when he passed away in our mother Aisha radiyallahu anha's arms. We said that Aisha radiyallahu anha was with him for a week continuously. She nursed him, gave him medicinal remedies, uh, did ruqya, recited Quran. She served him till the end. And she was the person he wanted to spend his final days with because not only was it because you know she loved him and she would show her love for him, but that he felt immense comfort in her company and in her care. She was the one who he complained to of his pain. He asked her to give charity on his behalf, you know, as in his final days, um, anything that needed sorting in terms of his finances and uh, giving things back to people who had given them to him for safekeeping, these types of things. She was uh, carrying these out for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had been her mentor and guide all her life, uh, a constant presence in her life since her childhood. Uh, she, he'd been her companion, her husband, her teacher. He was humorous, loving. Sometimes he exhorted her. He was always reminding her of the hereafter, always reminding her not to be materialistic and trying to train her and the other wives uh, to live without some of the lux luxuries of this life. Now his words and example would stay with her as her constant guide throughout her life. After the death of the Prophet وسلم, he was buried in her house. And we said that um, Aisha anha had previously seen in a dream that three moons had fallen into her room. And she'd related this dream to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. So when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died and he was buried in her house, Abu Bakr said to Aisha, this is one of your moons and he is the best of them. Of course, the impact of the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the on the ummah was immense. It was like the father of the whole ummah had passed away, right? But what did it mean for her? Of course, there was an immense sense of personal loss after the death of her beloved husband. Aisha radhiyallahu anha could now no longer get married again. So she would be uh, alone in that sense for the rest of her life. Again, we said that her mentor, her guide, her companion, uh, the person who loved her and said that she was the most beloved thing to him um, had passed away. And we can only imagine the sense of sadness and the loss that that moment was. After the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha radiallahu anha narrates that uh, his wives intended to send Uthman radiallahu anhu to Abu Bakr to ask him for their share of any inheritance, anything that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had left behind. But then Aisha radiallahu anha had said to the wives, didn't Allah's messenger say, our property, meaning the prophets, the property of the prophets is not to be inherited and whatever we leave is to be spent in charity. And so Aisha anha, again, she showed her knowledge here. She remembered uh, a saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about this and, and connected it to uh, this real life incident. And she said to them, don't you remember that he said this? And so then, 
the wives of the prophet did not request um, the inheritance because they realized and they remembered the advice of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam al abbas radiyallahu uh, anhu the prophet's uh, uncle and fatima radiyallahu anha also inquired about the prophet's inheritance and the same answer was given to them so neither aisha radiyallahu anha as a wife nor anyone else inherited anything from the wealth of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam but all of them uh, ahlul bayt they were all given a stipend uh, to cover their expenses okay from the bayt al mal so they had like a regular salary or a, a regular uh, amount of money that was uh, sent for them uh, to cover all of their needs her half brother abdullah we said he'd already passed away uh, after the siege of taif and so now she had uh, her sister asma she had her brother abdul rahman and uh, she also had her brother uh, muhammad ibn abi bakr fatima radiyallahu anha became ill 6 months after the death of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and abu bakr siddiq made sure to visit her um, and made sure that she was happy uh, and then as we said she she passed away sadly very soon after the death of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam abu bakr siddiq used to consult with aisha during uh, his own khilafa aisha used to give fatwas independently and uh, she continued to do this until she passed away because if you think about it she was a very unique source of knowledge not only had she seen Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam day to day in his most private moments, uh, but also she was so inquisitive. She was always asking him questions. She'd witnessed his ibadah. She'd witnessed his uh, his his purification. She'd witnessed so much with him um, that she was a key person to ask. Also, when it came to the revelation, so many verses of the Quran were either revealed in her house or she had asked questions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding them so she was a mufassira she had knowledge of the verses of the Quran Abu Bakr Siddiq was khalifa for around two and a half years he like Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam lived a very frugal lifestyle and was very strict on himself with regards to material things she continued to live in her house in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was buried, right next to Masjid al-Nabawi. And we said that this is now the area where the Green Dome is um, in Masjid al-Nabawi. Abu Bakr used to consult with Aisha, uh, but her status as a major scholar did not become so apparent uh, during this period, probably because of the recent death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Muslims being busy with the Ridda wars, the you know people who were causing trouble, trying to uh, stop paying zakah, or people leaving Islam because of the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Abu Bakr was dealing with all of that, and so that was like the primary concern uh, during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr. However, women used to visit her regularly. Uh, she would go on Hajj, and so they would. Uh, especially during Hajj season, come to ask her questions. If they knew that she was, you know, in a particular uh, place on Hajj, they would all flock there to ask questions, to have their questions answered. And then it came the time for Abu Bakr as Siddiq's uh, final illness. Uh, he became ill two and a half years after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and our mother Aisha radila anha nursed her own father as well. This illness of Abu Bakr lasted about 15 days. Uh, Aisha radiyallahu anha was known for her poetry and her knowledge of poetry. Just like Abu Bakr as Siddiq, she was very eloquent. And once, you know, in the past when Zainab bin Jahsh had complained about something related to Aisha, Aisha had responded so sharply 
that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had turned to Zainab and said, "Well, what can I do? You know, she's the daughter of Abu Bakr, right? Because Abu Bakr Siddiq was known for his eloquence and and sharpness." On Abu Bakr as Siddiq's uh, deathbed, Aisha radhiyallahu began to recite poetry. She said to him, "La'amruka ma yughni tharau an al-fata." إذا حشرجت يوما وضاق بها الصدر by your life wealth does not avail a man at all when the day comes that the soul rattles in the throat constricts the breast her father told her don't say things like that my daughter instead say وجاءت سكرة الموت بالحق ذلك ما كنت منه تحيد and the intoxication of death will bring the truth. That is what you were trying to avoid. From the Quran, Surah 50, Ayah number 19. And then she said also uh, in praise of Abu Bakr, وَأَبْيَضَ يُسْتَسْقَ الْغَمَامُ بِوَجْهِهِ رَبِيعُ الْيَتَامَ عِسْمَةُ الْلِلْ One who is so pure, even rain clouds are quenched by his countenance. He is the spring breeze for orphans, protector of the widows. And of course, she was referring to the fact that, uh, that uh, Abu Bakr, her father, uh, first of all, you know, she was saying he was so, he had such a bright face and, you know, his presence was so wonderful. And then she was saying that uh, he had always been known for being kind to orphans and protecting widows and supporting widows. When Abu Bakr Siddiq heard this, he said, that was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yani that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, this description is more befitting of him. So Abu Bakr asked uh, Aisha about uh, the Prophet's shroud. And she said, three white garments from Yemen. So he told her to wash a stain of the garment that he was wearing and to use his own garment as his shroud, saying, the living are more in need of new clothing than the dead. After the break, we will continue um, the life of Aisha, mother of the believers. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq was on his deathbed. He told Aisha Radilanha to do an inventory of his wealth. Since he'd become caliph, he uh, asked her to find out whether his wealth has, had increased at all. And she found that there was only one Nubian slave uh, who helped with his children and, uh, and there was one camel that was in his possession that were in excess of what he had had prior to becoming caliph. So he commanded that those things be sent to Umar bin al-Khattab, who would be the Khalifa after him. When Umar saw this, he cried so much, his tears started running on the ground, they said. He said, may Allah have mercy upon Abu Bakr. Ever since the Prophet died, he has worked himself to exhaustion. On his deathbed, Abu Bakr said to her, my daughter, by Allah, there is no human being that I would love more to see wealthy than you. And there is no one whose poverty after me is more grievous to me than you. I have given you a gift previously of 20 camel loads of fruit cuttings of palm trees. And he said to her, I feel uncomfortable about the way I distributed them. So return them and they will be the property of those who inherit. Um, and then he said to her, and indeed, uh, my heirs include your two brothers and two sisters. So divide them up by the book of Allah. Divide the inheritance up by the book of Allah. Aisha radiallahu agreed. So she gave back what her father had previously given her because he wasn't sure. And Abu Bakr was very, very scrupulous when it came to wealth and making sure that he was being fair. So she agreed and she said, father, even if it had been even more and more, such and such amount, I would have given it up. 
So this again shows Aisha Radilan her selflessness as well and her obedience to her father. Then she said, two sisters, yeah, that I only have Asma as a sister. Who is my other sister? And Abu Bakr Siddiq at this point said to her, she is in the womb of Bint Kharija, of Habiba Bint Kharija. And he said, it has been cast into my mind that the child, uh, Habiba Bint Kharija was pregnant at the time when Abu Bakr passed away. Uh, he said, it has been cast into my mind that the child is a baby girl. So make her your concern. In other words, uh, he was exhorting Aisha to look after and take good care of her baby sister that was, who was going to be uh, born after his death. And shortly after uh, Abu Bakr's death, Habiba bin Kharija, his wife, gave birth to Aisha's youngest sister, Umm Kulthum bint Abi Bakr. And we're going to see that the daughter of Umm Kulthum bint Abi Bakr Aisha bin Talha later on, uh, becomes a key student of our mother Aisha radila anha. Abu Bakr wanted Asma bin Umais to wash him and Abdul Rahman, his uh, son, to help. Uh, Asma bin Umais was his uh, other wife. Now we see from this point onwards, the emergence of Aisha radila anha as a uh, a political figure, as well as somebody with scholarly influence. And there were various causes for her emergence as a political figure. If you think about it, she was raised in a noble household. She was of the nobility, Quraysh, uh, and from both uh, her husband's home as well as her father's family were noble families. She lived in the home of the head of state, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, right? Her knowledge of Arab history was very deep because of her father. Her father was also very knowledgeable about genealogy and Arab history. Her sense of amana was very uh, keen for the guidance and direction of the ummah. And she had a real uh, political conscience, you know, uh, because she knew what life had been like at the time of the Prophet She knew the vision of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam because he'd articulated to, it to her throughout her life. Her father was also uh, the head of state after her husband. So she was in a political uh, situation for a long, long time. Causes for her emergence as a scholarly figure are also very understandable, right? She grew up with the Prophet's tarbiya. Uh, she had an excellent memory. She was sharp in her observation skills and intelligence. She was curious and always asking questions and very intelligent questions as well as follow-up questions. Uh, she witnessed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in all sorts of situations and she heard him uh, in the privacy of his home, right? Uh, sharing with her his real and deepest thoughts and feelings. She was articulate and eloquent in speech. So when she conveyed knowledge, it was very easily understood by people. Her curiosity and constant questions meant that she also had lots and lots of answers. She knew what the meanings of various verses were. She asked very logical questions and uh, you know, was not afraid to ask those questions. Uh, she was also, she had critical thinking skills. She didn't just leave uh, questions that were answered unless she felt satisfied with the answer. She also had immense confidence. Uh, this was part of her personality. And she had a sense of responsibility for the ummah a uh, sense of amana or uh, like a uh, sense that, you know, the Prophet's sunnah and his legacy were a trust that she should carry. So she had all of this as part of her scholarly conscience. Another aspect uh, of her life with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that made her a great, a knowledgeable person and a scholarly person is that 
She, of course, observed the delegates and uh, the visitors who came to the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, their conversations, and also she used to gain medicinal information from uh, those people who had traveled from various places all over Arabia. So she was known for her knowledge of medicine as well. Our mother Aisha anha, had immense ghayra for the deen. She felt this sense of protectiveness over the legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. An example of the sorts of uh, people that came to visit her uh, regularly were people would bring their babies to her to ask for dua. And once she became angry when she saw an amulet around the neck of a baby. Um, and she, her anger mirrored the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's anger. There is no doubt that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam banned fortune telling and was very angry with those who did this too, she said to this family who'd come to visit her. Um, another example is that when Muslims had conquered different lands, there were all sorts of new beverages that suddenly came, they, ca they suddenly came into contact with all sorts of new beverages, new drinks. And so they would bring uh, them or bring information about them to her mother Aisha anha, to ask her uh, about such and such a beverage, such and such ingredient. And she, she would advise them to avoid bever beverages of an unknown nature. Um, another example of the sorts of uh, visits she might get. Amra bint Abdurrahman said that Aisha radiallahu anha said, if the messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, had seen what women are doing now, he would have forbidden them from going to the mosques, just as the women of Banu Israel were forbidden. So, you know, she said this in response to seeing some women who'd visited her or, you know, or, or had been in her company who were either dressed or behaving in a way that uh, was, was not becoming of a Muslim woman. And uh, Yahya bin Sa'id, who is one of the, uh, who was listening to this hadith, he asked, Amra, uh, Aisha Radhanha's uh, student, were the women of Bani Israel forbidden to go into the mosques? And she said, yes. During Umar's rule, uh, the rule of Umar bin al-Khattab, anhu, her status as an alima, as a scholar, became even more apparent. Umar and the other Sahaba would ask her questions about every area of the Prophet's home life that only someone like her could really know about. The wives of the Prophet وسلم, had memorized many a hadith of the Prophet, especially Umm Salama and Aisha. Uh, the senior Sahaba used to send messengers to her to ask about various practices of the Prophet. Umar bin al-Khattab used to send uh, people to ask Aisha questions all of the time. One example of this is when one of Umar's friends had sent charity to some convicted women, women who had been convicted of prostitution and were being punished. Uh, these women uh, were sent a roll of cloth in charity by Amr bin Umayyah. And they were being punished and excluded from society as a punishment. And Umar told Amr angrily that such charity would not be accepted by Allah. But Amr insisted, saying that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said about such women, the things you give them are considered charity for you too. But because Umar hadn't heard this, he became really angry and he said this was a slander against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So basically they almost had a very big argument about it. So they agreed to go to Aisha Radiallahu Anha for a solution. Amr asked Aisha, didn't you hear the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying the things that we give them are considered as charity for you too? And Aisha replied, as Allah is my witness, yes, I heard that. So Umar bin al-Khattab was shocked and he became quite sad and he started to lament saying, 
Who knows how much I missed hearing from Allah's Messenger while I was busy with my business. Uh, so he began to lament the fact that because of his work, he hadn't spent as much time as he'd wished he could have with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And so he missed hearing uh, this type of knowledge from him. In the next episode, we will continue looking at uh, the legacy and life of Aisha radiallahu anha during the Caliphate of Umar, Uthman, and then uh, look at the incident of the camel which is a very famous incident that happened in the life of our mother Aisha radila anha. Until then, jazakumullahu khairan, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.